Welcome to The Miniatures Papers. Today we're going to talk about a clockwork townhouse terrain piece that I just finished building. Alright, welcome back guys. Uh, here is the next house in the town that I'm trying to build here. First thing I want to talk about is creating templates. When you create a template for something, it's so much easier to recreate that same piece, especially if you have to do multiple of the same pieces. So what I'm doing here is I am measuring out the height and width of the building sides that I want. Uh, what I also do, once I replicate them there, I'll give you the sizes. Uh, this one here is uh, three and a half inches by six inches for the uh, front wall, and for the side walls, it's three and a half by eight inches, right there. And uh, I did that and replicated for all four walls, right there. Uh, the front I cut out uh, to be two inches high by one inch across, and that's for a standard doorway for a medium sized figure. And here on the bottom, uh, I have 8 by 12 inch, and that is going to serve as a base where I'm going to actually uh, hold the actual building while I'm painting it and stuff like that. And then I'm going to peel that off later. It's just so much easier to hold. Sort of like, you know, I use uh, pill bottles for my miniatures, but this time I'm using an actual uh, chipboard um, to actually have the material easier to hold and I like using chipboard because it's a stronger material and it doesn't bend as much and just for me it's uh, sturdier. Alright so what I'm going to use is one two three blocks or mechanics uh, blocks or machinist blocks and I use these because they're really really heavy and they help me create a 90 degree angle for my walls in this way. You put them there uh, you glue one side up and then you put it over here on the opposite side with another one. They usually come in packs of two. I bought them on Amazon. Actually, I have four of them around here just in case. I don't know. You never know. They're just really heavy and they're very, very weighted. And they're really cool because you have those little dots in there. Uh, and those dots, you actually, you can screw things into. So if you want to hold things in between sizes and stuff like that, you can actually have that as well. I've never used this feature just yet, but maybe one day it's going to cause to use this feature. And then the whole point of this hobby is learning new things and discovering things and it's always very exciting for me to discover new things and use things in, in ways that I've never tried before so you know life is just all new to me and I'm like looking around excited about all the things that I can learn uh, and I always thought learning for me is just really exciting okay so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put some poster tack on the outside just to hold the pieces together uh, while I glue the insides now the insides you're not gonna really see so I can go to town with the glue and that's fine all right, that's gonna hold you there. Uh, and I use hot glue. I'm using Gorilla Glue's uh, glue sticks. I like those from a hot glue gun, and I have the ultimate glue gun, and that's what it, the name of it is. I don't know. It was big, and I have clumsy hands, and I like uh, big things uh, to hold in the hand. It's just easier for me. Although, if you want something small, the CNC Better hot glue gun is pretty awesome. But I do not have one of those. I have one of these because I got them for a really, really good price, and I picked it up at AC Moore. Um, and I do like it. The only thing I wish it had is an on and off setting, but it has dual temperature, which is pretty cool. All right, so there you go. I glue it on the inside, make sure I uh, get rid of any spidering and stuff like that. And the thing about glue guns is that it, the glue actually dries pretty darn fast, which is really, really cool. Um, and I mean, it gives you very little time to manipulate it. So if you got it wrong, make sure you fix it really quickly. And that's one of the drawbacks of using a uh, hot glue. But one of the benefits is, is that if you've done this many times and, and you dry fit it many times and you just got to go in and, you know, just record away, you know, um, I mean, put a, put together and just glue away so this way it's straight, then yeah, if you know what you're doing there uh, because you've dry fitted it so many times, then it is perfect for my application. Alrighty, so I'm going to try to do the other side here. Uh, and I also use a lot of dry fitting, okay, because... Uh, sometimes I don't make a straight cut. Sometimes it's not perfect. And, you know, that, uh, you know, I'm not perfect. So there you go. And you may want to dry fit it as many times as possible. So this way, you know, it's about the right size that you want it to. So I go back and forth with that. I reinforce things with the glue gun. And again, if you're gluing it on the inside, it's really not going to pop on the outside. So you don't really have to worry about if it's going to get messy or not. 
it's just the way it is, right? And um, okay, so this is my second house in a series. I did record another one. Uh, it was called The Lonely Hearts Cottage. Uh, on that one, it took me three videos and I think there were two, three hours each. I don't know, it was like six, seven hours to put that together. I'm always trying to get more efficient with my videos uh, as well as you know the content that I put on and the quality. And so what I did here is I condensed the entire build process to uh, about one hour and uh, 40 something minutes. And uh, in doing so, um, I, I just cut out all the excess and stuff like that. And uh, what you're left with is how I built it. Which, again, um, I'm learning. I'm trying to become more efficient in doing. Uh, this is a really fun build. Uh, and it's really fun that I'm actually creating a town for my uh, Trollkin army or my Warma Hordes game. And I guess I can use it for Malifaux too. I'm just going to have to do some se uh, several layered things like possibly, you know, a balcony for one. Um, I did go around my hometown and I saw these like large churches and I'd like to recreate one of them, you know, and just like take it and do it to scale. I mean, I can go crazy with it, but again, it's for wargaming, so maybe I won't go crazy with it. I do want to have the same style as, as these. And I think what brings it together here is the same thatched roof, like that roof line where I take the, uh, the popsicle sticks and I just chop them down and it looks really great. Um, I like the way they come out, and I think that's a theme throughout the entire town. So no matter what the building looks like, the colors that I use, even if they're funky, because people paint their house different colors, and you know maybe if they get it from the same quarry, that's one thing. But this is like you know we have blue skin trolls running around and everblights and all this other kind of fantasy uh, figures. So I mean. You don't have to be so accurate, in my opinion. You can just have some fun with it. And this, building this town, it, it's not my main hobby. This is something I do to palette cleanse. And what I mean by that is that I paint miniatures and so that I don't burn out. I usually switch hobbies onto something else. Uh, so this way, you know, I can keep it fresh. Uh, so when I go back to painting miniatures, I'm not like tired of it because this is miniature 323 or anything like that. Although each miniature does have its own uh, appeal to it. But I kind of like changing it up. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get a straight square. I'm using factory edge on that with a T-square. And then I'm using my uh, transparent ruler, which I really do like. Uh, and you can get them at the hobby shops. That's where I got all the materials. I'm using my snap blade and I'm just... I'm pretty okay with doing straight lines and just following and tracing the lines that I've already did with a pencil, so that's pretty cool. Um, and it takes practice, but you know, again, it's not perfect. If I wanted it to be perfect, I have a metal ruler I can go across and just go through it and just rip it straight through. Again, if you want to do a snap blade, you could do a snap blade. Um, you could do a foam cutter. I do have the Proxon in there. I just didn't feel like using it right now. I don't know, just didn't feel like it. Uh, so there you go. So I can make these perfect, but I didn't want them to be because the stonework isn't perfect, the town isn't perfect. I mean, even some of the shingles on the roof are misaligned, and I did that on purpose. And um, I, you know, make cuts and stuff and make them uneven because I don't want it to be perfect. I want it to be like this little shanty town, uh, not a sprawling metropolis or anything like that. But you know, a little shanty town that I can use for terrain features when I'm uh, doing either Malifaux or. Um, or gaming, or D and D, or any kind of games like that. Plus, um, I kind of my uh, a lot of my family kind of likes when I do the houses. Like my mom kind of likes the houses. I think she thinks they're cool. So yeah, you know what? Approval from mom. Hey, there you go. Thumbs up. How many times you get that? Uh, <laughs> I guess. Well, I enjoy making them either way. So that's just a bonus. Okay, so now what I do with these uh, foam pieces and this ready board, I got this from uh, Dollar General. I do like the black ones. For some reason, they peel off easier than the white ones for me. Although I heard that if you put a little bit of alcohol on the paper for the white ones, that they'll peel off, you know, very, very easily. And all I'm doing is just putting these foam pieces after I cut them the same length as the, the, the uh, fronts in the back and cut out the door. And I'm just laying them on top. See, like a T cross section right there. I'm trying to get it even so I get an idea of what I need to do. Now, instead of scrolling things out uh, with a pen, I am using, I'm going to use a textured roller uh, in order to get the design on the walls uh, for the foam. So that's something new that I'm trying here. Um, I thought about doing it a while ago, but I'm 
Black Magic Craft definitely beat me to it. So uh, you can check out their channel, Black Magic Craft. Uh, this dude from uh, he's from Canada, and I mean he does amazing stuff too. But you know, oh, beat me to it. <laughs> I was thinking about the textures rollers when he came out, and was like, oh, textures rollers. So I'm giving the credit to him. You're amazing, dude. Rock on. All right, but you know, it just makes sense that if you can impress things and um, really can just like speed up the time in which you actually create your projects, especially a project like this for me, um, then I'm just going to take the shortcut. <laughs> just do it, man. Just have fun with it. You don't have to toil so much in life unless you enjoy toiling uh, to create something. You just have to create it, get it on the table, get it painted, get it done, get it to the quality that you're happy with. And that's what the hobby is all about. It's about your, you know, happiness with a, a level of painting, a level of quality, and it's up to you. Now, if you, if, if trying to go for a perfect model and going, reaching the, well, I think it's the impossible goal of perfection, um, and that frustrates you, and then you don't build anymore, then it's counterintuitive and counterproductive. So you have to choose a product where you know you can get through and see some accomplishment and feel really good about yourself when you're done. That's what motivates you to keep going. If not, you'll be on the same terrain piece for the next 30, 40 years. And if that's your gig, man, then or, or lady, then that's your gig. But not me, man. I have like a ton of projects to to that I'm excited to get started and really show and bring to you and all this other stuff. So I'm not going to get really bogged down by too many of the details. I try to be accurate, but you know, uh, I, you know, just not go for the perfect perfect thing. And um, when it comes to painting miniatures, I always kind of want to get better and kind of learn new things. And uh, if I never win a contest, then I'll never win a contest. But if I win a contest, then that would be amazing. But, you know, that's not what the point of this is. The point of it is uh, getting those models done, sharing it with you guys, and, you know, going on this uh, journey of learning how to do this stuff together, you know. And it doesn't – it's not just miniatures. It's um, – learning how to do the YouTube and the video and the editing and the sound and uh, buildings and terrains and um, still working on my game table. And that's going to be a show in and of itself. It might be a longer show than this show over here. Uh, plenty of editing. I have a lot of footage uh, on creating it uh, or assisting to create it. But, you know, the same principles, a lot of the same principles are there. Uh, I'm going to talk to... Um, my father-in-law and my uncle-in-law, and uh, we we'll probably talk. I'll, I'll see if I can get them on the mic, and they can talk to you about you know tables and creating tables, and maybe we can open it up. I, I'm trying for the live screen thing. I don't know. I hear Twitch is a thing. I don't know. All right, so when I line up these uh, foam pieces, you're going to see like gaps in between where the pieces meet, and that's fine. That was intentional because what I'm going to fill up those gaps in with is a little piece of balsa wood that I picked up from uh, AC Moore. Those balsa wood pieces are a dollar each, and I picked up a couple of those. Uh, it's worth it because it gives uniform size, and I did not feel like, uh, well, I didn't have long enough popsicle sticks in order to cover that length, so, I mean, it's just perfect, and it fit perfect. And I see with the black ones how it just really peels off that foam, which is really great. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a textured roller. Now, I had cobblestone, but this is more of uh, not just cobblestone, but it has a design to it. I think that's a, the name of it right there. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, so, um, but you can take any kind of texture that you want for these rolling pins. And I got it for Green Stuff World. I ordered that over there uh, on Amazon. Really cool stuff. They have like miniature leaf makers. They have, you know, um, birch seeds that look like leaves. Uh, and they have hole punches for leaves. And they have these amazing rollers, which I love. Now I'm pressing... And I could use the gummies on the side to keep it even, but pff, whatever, you know. <laughs> I was just going for it. I kept it pretty even. I went pretty slowly. I used a pretty much a decent amount of pressure there because this board is not as soft as the other board uh, that I get, which is just polystyrene, the pink stuff. But look at the, the results here. That's pretty decent, man. Look at that. Now, what I would have to do to get that texture is hand manually do each hole back and forth and spend hours. So I just did that in a fraction of the time, and I'm all about the shortcuts, man. I'm all about getting good quality quality stuff and doing it quickly 
and doing it to the level where I'm happy with, you know, and to be able to create. That's my thing, you know. I like to make things. I like to learn things. All right, so I did all four sides, and you see on the corners there, I do have that banding, and that's that balsa wood. Um, you just kind of get it to the size that you want. Here are the measurements for the top layer. Um, it's a little bigger than the, 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 the bottom layer there uh, for the building itself. I think I went one inch in each direction for the building. And then I put, before I did that, I actually put some styrofoam uh, in the inside of the door there because I'm going to put some popsicle sticks in there and create a door. Now, it's not going to be a, a functioning door, which I could have created, but I didn't feel like it. So that's just me. All right, so I glued the top on there. So we have two layers here, a second floor. And um, I just cut out some pieces, just like the bottom piece there. Um, and what I'm going to do is go to build that on top of here. Same principles as with the bottom, but with the top, and it's going to go all the way to the edge. That's what I want to do. Um, there's a template for the Lonely Hearts Cottage. At first, I was thinking that template, but no, I'm not going to use that template. I'm going to go larger. I'm going to go straight to the ends of it. And since it doesn't need a doorway, it's not a problem. So this is the first time I ever built two layers of a building or two floors of a building. So I'm just trying it out and see what it would be like, you know. And this is a learning process, like I said before. And I'm actually learning it on camera. So I didn't build a building before, see how it would work, and then build another building to put it on the video. No, this is the first original building that I do for uh, the first time on uh, video. And I say, just go for it, you know. And is it going to come out perfect? Nope. Am I going to make mistakes? Yep. Am I going to learn stuff from those mistakes? Yep. But in the next building, am I going to employ the, the things that I learned for the last ones, last mistakes that I made and correct those? Yep. That means I'm going to get better with every build. So first Lonely Hearts Cottage, probably the worst product that I have made, which came out pretty good. And now I'm just going to keep improving on that and just keep getting better. And you're going to see me through this journey. So every time you see a video, you see that it's going to get better than the last one. And that's what I do when I measure success. I always compare myself to what I was before. I never compare myself to other people's work because, you know, I'm not going to be chasing a dream. I'm not those other people. I don't have their experience, you know, so I'm not them. Look, I'm breaking the house already. Ha <laughs> ha, I'm just kidding. So what I did was is the same thing with the uh, <clears throat> mechanics, um, sorry, machinist blocks or one, two, ABC blocks, one, two, three blocks. That's what it is. And you can look it up as one, two, three blocks or uh, machinist blocks, and they should come up. Uh, I use Anytime Tools. I like Anytime Tools. Um, you can use anyone, really. All right. So um, what I did was the same as the bottom, where I put the one, two, three blocks in, and I put the um, poster tack on the outside, and then I glued it on the inside, and then I did the, the other walls. And I didn't want to bore you with the same thing uh, over and over again. Again, I wanted to cut down and streamline this video as much as possible, so this way we don't have another six hours uh, and three videos on one thing. Um, and you can see the build from start to finish all in one show and in under two hours which is definitely an accomplishment for me. Um, the more I build, the quicker I get because I can employ tactics that I've already, you know, step by steps, will this work, will this work, will this work, will this work, will this work. Instead of debating that, I know it works already. I'm gonna try that, you know, and if I wanna expand upon it, maybe I'll expand just a little bit so I get a little bit better each time. But I become much more efficient this way. Okay, so one way is to measure it out, uh, but since I'm not uh, exactly sure if uh, the measurements of when I cut out the, the the floor of the second layer, I don't think it's absolutely perfect. So what I do was uh, I kind of get the gist of it, kind of get it wet, see if it fits on top, use a machinist block, make sure that it's uh, pretty straight. And then I put it on top, and if I need to tweak it just a little bit, I tweak it just a little bit before the glue dries. So. Put it on, put it on top, adjust it if I need to, and there you go. Then all I have to do is glue the top to the bottom there, and you'll have that second layer. Now, some people, if you want to, you can actually leave these independently. And what I would do here is like get a piece of styrofoam that's a little bit smaller than the area on the inside of the house there, stick it in the middle of the cardboard that's on the second level, and then you don't have to glue the top to that second floor, you can actually lift it up. And then you could do is you could scroll out a floor or use a roller pin on the floor. So this way you actually have the building and you can lift off the top piece and see the floor of the second floor and you can put things on it. So if you're playing D&D &D and you want it to go for that kind of realism, you can do that. But 
No, what I do in a campaign or how I think my campaign is going to run is that they enter the building. That's great. So now I'm going to switch, take the building out, reset up the inside uh, in a different building. And I'll have like tiles of wood or something like that and recreate it. Now, uh, it could be actually bigger than the dimensions of the actual building. And that is just fine. You know, it's fantasy anyway. And it's all about the fun. And that's how I do anyway. Um, yeah, but this is like, this is a really fun build for me. And the fact that I got through it pretty quickly is outrageously I'm, I'm outrageously happy about that. So here it is, uh, removable top. Again, if you put a foam floor on the bottom, you don't have to do this step in glue. The foam floor will actually hold the top piece in place, depending how snug you make it. But it's up to you, okay? This I decided to glue. This step could be an option for you. So here you go, I'm just trying to get it along here. I gotta make sure I move quickly because it might dry. And the cardboard is weak enough that I can shift it back and forth. And I just want to make sure the corners are all set. And there you go. Just make sure I push the corners in and do it quickly before that glue dries. And I'm really happy with how it came out. Now you can see some light poking in through the bottom. That means it's not perfect. But then again, like I said, it's not. I'm not very perfect. Plus, I'm going to put a wooden piece of uh, banding around with the gaps where the floor meets the, uh, the, the second floor. The top floor meets the second floor. And that's going to be in the shape of, of some balsa wood, which is I'm going to include into the banding. That balsa wood is actually going to be on top of larger pieces of either obsidian. I was going to put, I was going to go for wood at first, and you can paint it any way you want, but I think I made it obsidian. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You will see that. But all the corrugation is going to get covered, so I am not worried at all. And I think it's pretty even. Yeah, pretty happy with that. That's pretty cool. There you go. And the good thing about that, that hot glue is like it's already dried. No problem. It's not going to fall off. Yay. Second floor is on. You got to work on building steps and incorporating it to a second floor, maybe in the next video or so. There is a, a, uh, a church in my town that I want to kind of recreate in the design for my city, but it's like, it's huge. It's a huge church. It's a huge piece. You know, it's going to take a lot. I have to scale it down so it can fit on my uh, my 4x6 table that I'm making for uh, for gaming. Alrighty, so now uh, all I'm doing is uh, the same process I did for the bottom. I'm going to do for the top where I'm going to texture roller it. And um, cobblestone works well here. I think. I think I got some Celtic sim Celtic symbols in there or royal symbols in there. Um, but, you know, I'm just changing it up. Now, this is my test run anyway. I'm thinking about getting just the cobblestones, but I don't know, maybe. It works pretty well. I And also, I think with the next one, maybe I, I'll try it without the cardboard and see what happens if I just do the pink foam uh, like they do in Black, Black Magic Craft. But I'll just try it out and see if I like it or not. But this way, I'm doing it my method. But again, I'm always trying new things. And uh, yeah, I, I go on to YouTube a lot and I check out uh, Daka Daka Forms and I check out... Um, uh, paint and putty and I check out like a ton of different sources and then I try what other people do and then I kind of just you know since I'm not perfect I'll make a whole bunch of mistakes and do it my own kind of convert things or it's like well that seems to be too difficult for me to do so I'm just gonna do it my way you know and you can do that with this hobby because there are no rules there are no rules this is all about having fun and that's that um, and that's the beauty of it Alrighty. So, and you see it goes on really well. Just a little bit of uh, dab of glue will do. And um, yeah, it's really coming together and it's really exciting, you know, to just use a rolling pin instead of just etching out every single stone. Or, you know, the alternative method is also is uh, cutting out little stones and putting them in one at a time. But I ain't got time for that. You might have time for that, but I don't have time for that. That's for sure. I just kind of just going to get it done. Want to make it look good. It's a terrain piece. I'm happy with it. The end. Okay. And that's it. So I like the ease of the way this comes out. Remember to cut at the exact signs. Use that template that you use for the cardboard to create the walls. Use that. Now, I cut this circle out uh, here on the top, and what I use is one of those uh, sample cups, or you know, like those when you get uh, any condiment cups, 
and I just did it around the edges and then I used my snap blade to cut it out. I did it off screen. Um, <clears throat> and you know, it's roughly cut and that's okay. I didn't care. You can sand that down, I guess, but uh, I didn't care. I was like, whatever, dude. All right, I'm gonna glue that on there. See, at first I was gonna do some stained glass through there, but uh, I have a lot of bits and pieces of things that I collect uh, when I go to stores or anything like that. And I do like that, that steampunk stuff and I kind of want to incorporate that too. So I was just looking to my stuff and saying, maybe you can add something into that circle. And I came up with like a, a mock clock face. Now, could I have used a real clock face? Yeah, absolutely. I could have. Yeah. That's not even an issue. I could have definitely used it and used like a template in the back and put it on the back, cut out the hole into the cardboard and actually fit the, the clock piece into there with a brace in the back that I could have hot glued and it would have been an actual clock ticking. However, changing the batteries, I don't know, I'd have to figure that out. I do want to put a clock tower together. So that might actually use uh, clock bits in it as well. So, and that comes from an inspiration from uh, somebody who left a comment on one of my YouTube, on one of my Facebook um, posts. And I think I posted to Reaper Miniatures and they said, was that a real clock? And I'm like, no, but you just inspired my next build. And my, um, my uh, st stepson, Caleb, he actually said, hey, is that a real clock? And I was like, no. But I told him the story, you know, inspired me for a new build. So, And he also came up with the idea of clock tower. So you the man, Caleb. All right. So here's where I take the balsa wood. And I'm not even measuring it because it, what if the cut wasn't perfect? So what I'm doing is just drawing a line and measuring, eyeballing the height, drawing a line, and then sawing it out. So this way I can cover... Um, so I can cover the where the pieces of uh, styrofoam are not connecting and there is uh, cardboard in the back. There you go, a little hacksaw here for hobbying. Uh, I really don't remember where I picked that up, but it's very useful. I guess it's a jeweler's knife or something? I don't even know. I don't know. I look at tool aisles too, like I go in there for hobbies and I kind of look at the tools that they have. Also, I go into trade shows and check that out and I do like, you know, yard sales and, and garage sales and some people, sometimes they have tools. Dentist tools are specifically health, uh, helpful as well. So you may want to pick those up. All right, and it's very easy to put that and cover up the banding and I did it at a 45 degree angle from the uh, 90 degree angle that's created with the cardboard. Uh, creating that gap and it just fills out that gap pretty easily. I love that. I do like ease of use for certain and um, a lot of fun, definitely. Uh, I'm just like really surprised how quickly this actually came together compared to the last one and, and really making me look forward to the next build that I'm going to do, which I haven't decided on what I'm going to do there. Possibly a tavern because every town has a tavern. Especially in D&D. Uh, &D. Yeah, that's where adventure starts. So maybe a town square, a fountain, or maybe that clock in the middle. Kind of make it look really, really cool. Um, and that's the goal here. But uh, I only have so much room and so many houses, and I don't want to overcrowd it. I don't want it to be like infinity or something like that, where it's just buildings. I mean, it could be, but I don't know if I want to do a that heavy cover, you know. I mean, I guess if you have a non-shooty army... You can have a lot of cover, and then it's all about, you know, it's all about getting up close and personal. Okay, so I had extra pieces of styrofoam here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this piece here, and here's a Proxa on hot wire cutter, and I do like the way I can rip straight through. Uh, it makes it real easy to rip these through, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make strips here. I'm going to cut those strips down, and what I'm going to do is simulate big pieces of wood holding up the second floor. Yep. Uh, and y as you can see, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect piece that I use it in because it adds character to it and something I just, you know, I leave uh, pink foam uh, lying around all the pieces that I don't use and, you know, I can make strips and I can make other things out of them. Alrighty. So what I do is just going to cut those and I'm going to make these L brackets over here. All right, I'll show you how I make the second piece. Uh, just take those strips that I do and just cut it. And it is actually 
the same sizes and I just keep making them and gluing them together and there you go you just make the L bracket which makes it really really easy to do now you can scribe in those L brackets if you want to to make it look like wood I didn't um, so at first I was going to paint them like wood but I'm painting them obsidian instead to make it look different since uh, I decided I go I went for the clock kind of appearance I wanted to make it look different from all the other houses but at the same time, knowing that it's the same village, village again, that roof ties it in. Okay, here's where I uh, cover the uh, the corrugation from the cardboard with that balsa wood strips. And in order to hold the balsa wood strips up, I am going to put these uh, big wood or obsidian brackets, the L brackets that I just made. And I want it to be even, so uh, if it's three and a, well, no, it was uh, six inches across, I don't recall. But I divided the number by two, and then I put it to the right and the left, and I just want to make sure it's even. I usually do things in inch format, so I just wait for an inch, and then um, on each side, and made it look even, so this way I put it in the middle, and I marked where about the center of the line is on both sides. And writing them in there uh, helps out just a bit because then I know when I hot glue it, I know exactly where to put it. There is that hot glue gone. And I'm just putting on a little bit on the top and a little bit on the edge, and then just like putting it straight on, super easy to do and super quick. And you kind of want to get it a little straight and even because you're going to put that banding and the banding is actually going to lay on top of there. So it looks like it's actually holding that up as well. And it hides the corrugation. So the banding has a dual purpose there, hiding corrugation and unifying the piece, which is great. Super easy to do. I do have... <laughs> If you, if you look in the background, I have my uh, <laughs> cell phone on, and I usually watch other YouTubers while I'm hobbying and, you know, just listen to what they have to say. I think that's Luke APS. I don't know. He's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that is him. Uh, so, yeah, and I, I'm constantly uh, – <laughs> I didn't mean to have that on the background, but, hey, yeah, you know what happens. Uh, and this is what and I do. Oh, no, that's Satine Phoenix. Okay. All right. Yeah, never mind. Uh, they're teaching you how to DM there. There's DM Tips, uh, Satin Phoenix, and that is on Geek and Sundry, uh, and it's pretty cool. And it inspires me, because now if I'm getting into a d and d mood and stuff like that, and I have, you know, DM Tips in the background, it helps me, you know, stay focused and uh, put this all together and motivates me to keep going. Which, you know, I kind of, I guess my grand idea of this channel is that you kind of do the same thing. I'm hobbying. Yeah, sure, you can learn some stuff, but we're hobbying together and we're on this journey together and we're learning and maybe you're hobbying on something else, like painting a mini or something like that. And then we're just working and together. Um, all right, so I tried to put this banding on for some reason. It just did not stick. It did not take. You know why? Because I waited too long to press it against this styrofoam. Now, when you're pressing these hot glue against the styrofoam, you're pretty much committing to what you're doing. So be very uh, cautious or conscious that once you stick it on, it, it, it's going to be it's going to rip off chunks if you try to take it off. Okay, so now I'm going to put it on the actual building itself, which might get a little messy there. Um, and I uh, try to be quick about it. Go, 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 go. Line it up, line it up, line it up. Go, 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 go. Hold the sides. And see, I'm holding the sides with the tips of my fingers as I'm bringing the banding into the middle and using my thumbs to press it in. That seems to be the formula in this case, and it worked out. There you go, just trying to get it even. Remember to lead, lean the banding on the bottom against those uh, the L-shaped brackets on the bottom because then it just makes it look like it's actually holding the top piece in. Plus, you're covering up any mistakes you might have made uh, by not having perfect cuts. That's the beauty of the banding. The beauty of the banding. I love it. And I'll work on all the other sides as well. And I'll do that off screen. All right, so... Now that we did the uh, top and the, the sides, what we're going to do here is we're going to think about putting on the roof. All right. So I took, uh, here I'm taking uh, sneaker boxes 
and I cut out the top. And the reason why I did that is because I want small corrugation to show. You know, I don't want large pieces of corrugation to show when I put the roof on. Like I did the Lonely Arts cottage, a cottage. I think that that was, uh, was a bit much. I'm not texture roll luring this because I'm going to put the thatched roof on it. So it really doesn't matter. So um, there you go. Just putting it all together, uh, the roof. And what I believe I used... Mm, I just went one inch over the size of the walls when it comes to the length of it and uh, go one inch over the size of the last roof I built. And I don't recall the measurements exactly, but if you measure it and measure the roof line, just go one inch over because you kind of want to overhang. Unless you want a ridiculously long overhang, then you go more than one inch over. But one inch over was, it was perfect for me. All right. So this I'm making an easy last build. I actually build uh, the flue to the uh, Lonely Hearts Cottage on the outside of the building. This one I'm doing in the middle of the building. So it's like an oven in the middle of the house, I guess, that's going to warm up the entire place. That's the idea of it. So just fitting it. You can see that, that one inch overhang uh, throughout. And in the front and the back, I think it's half inch because... Um, if one inch divided by two in the front and the back, there you go. You got that uh, half an inch. So what I'm going to do here is really quickly, I'm going to glue the edges. I'm going to do both sides really quickly into that corrugation. And, and when you put glue inside the corrugation, it actually sturdies it up a bit. Because um, you're actually filling in the corrugation just a bit to make it sturdy on those contact points. Which is important because the heaviest part of this entire building is going to be that thatched roof. So you kind of want to reinforce that as much as possible. Nope, it's coming up over there. I want to make sure it sticks down and dries. Hopefully it's not too late. And if it is too late, you can always go down inside the building and put that in there. Uh, put some more glue in there to reinforce it. That's great. But uh, for the last side, you're not going to have that opportunity because everything's going to be closed. So be mindful of that too. Again, working with hot glue, it's a blessing. And at the same time, it's a bane because you pretty much got to know what you're going to do right before you do it. And this repeat the med, I repeat the method in, in dry fit mode. That's what I call it, dry fit mode. And what I do is I put the piece on and I simulate putting the glue on and then putting the piece on, then I take it off. And then I do it like three times, take it off, simulate putting the glue on, take it off, put it on glue, take it off. And then I actually do the method with the actual glue gun where I actually put the glue on and I set it on. And there you go, I have the methodology and it's really quick, uh, especially when I'm doing something new. So I'm just trying to get as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Go, 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 go. Straight up, straight down. Go, go, go. There you go. There you go. I'm just getting another layer of glue, trying to fill in that corrugation and go. Now you do get spider webs, another thing that I call them spider webs, but you do get like trails of uh, glue gun bits going through. You just need to remove those. You know. But, you know, I really do want to make some kind of spider web diorama. You can I, I would definitely use that. It's fragile as all get out, though. It's, you know, once you break it, you break it. But, yeah, I mean, I would definitely use that as a spider web kind of thing because it's so thin and fluid. It's just amazing. Uh, travel, though, you super delicate, like I said. So you got to be careful about travel. And if dust gets on them, dust gets on them. You're not going to clean it off. You know, there's there's really, really, literally no way to clean that off. Uh, they might become more pronounced or whatever, but dust will fall on them. So in the long term, maybe it's not a great idea, but for a night's game, you can just use some hot glue, and there you go. All right, roof is on. There it is. Banding is all around the edges, and then I have those L brackets to simulate like big pieces of wood going through uh, the entire building holding up the second floor. Okay. Um, okay, so next up. Popsicle sticks, yes, craft sticks. That's uh, that's what I use for the thatched roof. And uh, wait, I got a stack. I forgot to mention that. Uh, and what I did was is I just make some cuts um, in the middle, and then I cut it on a forty-five degree angle. It's not perfect, and it's gonna sit on the top of the building uh, once I put. Uh, uh, another craft stick in the middle to hold up the top of the roof, also to um, cover up the banding. All right, so over here we have one inch 
and uh, that's how I made the thatch roof. It's one inch, and I use here a dentist tool, and I'm scribing wood lines into it to make it a little more realistic. And I do this to well, you see all the craft sticks that are on the table. I do it to all of them. And all the craft sticks that are on the table happens to not be enough for the thatch roof. I have to go back and get another handful and do it. So it really does take a lot of these craft sticks. And the last time I built these things, um, my hands, my knuckles and fingers were in a lot of pain. Because you see, I have a miter box in there and I cut every single line that I made for all these craft sticks. Uh, even more than what's on the table. Uh, I cut them one inch part by hand and the blade got stuck and it took forever and pressing it and holding the piece in place inside the miter box. I didn't even use something to uh, compensate the, the negative area, the gap that you have in there that's not the wooden piece you're cutting but the rest of the space in between. So I just used my finger and boy did it hurt. <laughs> it really hurt pretty bad. And I decided not to do that anymore. So I did this really dangerous thing, warding. There are safer ways to cut these small strips of wood. Please do not try this method at home. I must admit, though, it was super fast way to get it done. But I guess I'm not a fan of my hands because I could have cut myself as simply as and as quickly as I could sneeze. If you try this method at home, have an adults have adult supervision, which I recommend with use of any power tool. I hacksawed my last project's roof, and it took several hours. While this method was exceptionally quicker, and that much, it was that much more dangerous. So, if you do like your hands, do not do it this way. Period. There are rip fences and tables in which you can do it. I just didn't have them anymore. And I have a pretty steady hand when it comes to my Dremel tool. I do. And um, yeah, I did it like this because I just really did not feel like um, miter sawing any of that stuff there. And you see, I do it pretty quickly. Um, Super dangerous, super dangerous, all right? So what I did as I cut off the end, again, get a saw table, a miniature one. Proxon puts one out, I don't have it yet. And if I wanna put some detail into it, what I did was is that I just cut into it this way, which will cause like little holes and gaps in it. Then I cut it off and I kinda of let it hit the floor and the whole point in this, and the reason why I didn't cut my hand is because I took my time. And I, you know, I just, you know, made sure that I completely concentrated. I'm not multitasking or anything like that. But yeah, this is super dangerous. <laughs> so um, I do not recommend you do this. Get yourself a, a saw table, a, a, min a miniature small table, uh, saw table. Proxon puts one out. Uh, and you could rip your pieces easily. Uh, that way, I chose to do it this way because um, I, don't know, I was like put, drilling gun barrels out with uh, this uh, Dremel tool, and I've learned a lot of uh, hand control uh, when it comes to this. But still, that's no excuse. I mean, I was just being lazy. I was being a dumb butt. And uh, just really, really be careful. Actually, that, that blade that I'm using is for metal. It's not even for wood. So that's even super dangerous on top of that. I did buy the correct blade for it, though. So next time, I'm going to use a wooden blade. And I'm going to use, like, a cut shield or something like that. Um, because I can, like, all I need to do is sneeze. And then I just cut my hand. <laughs> But, you know, uh, the miter box does work. I just didn't feel like going through and doing this for, you know, the next 12 to 13 hours cutting these thatch roof out. This was just so much quicker. Just definitely not safer. Okay. And you can put a little kind of design elements into it. You could cut the thatch. Uh, you can cut it in the sides and on the top. And I kind of went 
a little nuts. Sometimes I went uh, did two or three uh, notches in them just to give it some character and switch it up a bit. On some of them, not all of them. Um, I wouldn't recommend all of them. You kind of want to have a variant to it. Once uh, the majority of it being just nice and even, and the rest of them being, you know, optional. Um, okay, so I used a early American 230 satin penetrating wood finish to get the actual wood finish for each one of these uh, thatches, and that's that's the the claim to fame or the unifying purpose of these thatched roofs. Uh, is that I actually stain each and every one of them instead of painting them. And kind of, I like the way that they look. Now, when it comes to the banding as well, throughout the entire building, I painted them onto the actual surface. Now, you got to really, really be careful because when you have acrylic paint, this is like, uh, this stain has like an oily texture to it, and it'll soak into your paint jobs, and it'll stain them and make it a lot darker. In fact, that's how I got the obsidian uh, bars, crossbars that went through the house on the second floor, those little L brackets. I actually just painted them with some uh, wood finish stain and made them like obsidian, shiny, and different, which is what I was going for. Okay, so I switched it up, and I do have these little pincers that uh, I picked up at a yard sale, uh, but you can get them at a medical supply place. They just give you so much control. Look how quickly I can just get this done. And you can soak them to get it darker uh, or not. And I kind of like that unevenness, like some of the boards get more stain than the others, and it just brings character to it, in my opinion. But as you can see, there's quite a few bits in here. That was not enough for the roof. I actually had to go back and do quite a bit more uh, to get it done. But that's okay. I used my new very dangerous method in um, <laughs> cutting those apart. Um, I, I can't express it anymore unless you're a professional and you have, if you're underage or anything like that, use your parents' permission or guidance or supervision with somebody who is a professional before you even attempt to, to use any of the power tools and stuff like that because uh, you can really give you some grievous injuries uh, if you don't know what you're doing there. So. Yeah, I just did a shortcut. Yeah. Okay, so dipping, swing a shortcut instead of using tweezers, these things give you so much more control. And, you know, when it comes to actually putting a whole bunch of these together, it, it, look how much control you got. I love it. I do love it. And since I have a lot to do here, it makes it so much easier. And I lay them out on a, a doubly folded... Um, paper towel. I should have triple or quadruple folded it. But, you know, I line my table in um, newspaper so this way I can soak some of that up. And soak it did. It actually stains right through and soaked into the newspaper as much as I tried to prevent it. But these things are soaked. So it's, it's got to do that. <laughs> it's going to get all over the place. So uh, I would put extra uh, newspaper down and then you you can use the method where you can use the paper towels as well and then you can throw away the newspaper that it bled through okay so that makes it really super easy to get through all right again this is not enough to be able to do it i think i needed another sheet to finish the whole thing but those are the boards of woods and you can see there's a variance in uh tone next mod podge i use matte matte Mate and some Stano Res primer together, and I mix it into a little jar here or a little container here. And the reason why I mix it is because when I'm just painting a uh, Mod Podge on a piece, sealing the piece, uh, I do intend to um, spray paint this uh, black, a black bond it. And when you put spray paint or rattle can paint onto styrofoam, it melts the styrofoam. So, uh, I find sealing all the styrofoam bits in this uh, Mod Podge helps. And having it black or black tinted, you know exactly what you hit and what you missed. So having any color is fine, but I like black because it's a good contrast with the white styrofoam. And you'll know like if you missed an area or not. So this way when I do spray paint all of this, it won't melt the styrofoam and... Um, because the propellants in a rattle can, the propellants in rattle can, uh, whatever chemical that is to propel the paint out, that has the chemical reaction with styrofoam that will melt it. So, um, so doing this method, and I brush it on, 
Uh, now this is about the most time consuming thing, but you can see right here, it looks ugly as all get out, but uh, it is coated. Now the banding itself, I'm gonna, I actually hand paint the wooden pieces to give it that texture, uh, to give it the roof kind of a look to it. So I wanted to cover those pieces of balsa wood up. Now I took painter's tape and I put them one inch apart and then with the see-through um, see ruler, which I love so, so much, um, I got it in an art supply store. It's really cool stuff. All right. And um, I'm just measuring in small strips. I kind of took the balsa wood piece and kind of measured it. And I think it was one unit square across. I don't know how many inches that is or, or whatever. I don't know. I think it's a quarter of an inch maybe, a third of an inch, fifth of an inch. It was small. It was the size of the balsa wood. So this way I can actually put the tape in. And of course, I didn't cut them straight as more as much as I possibly could. I cut them straight. Sometimes I put strips, uh, two strips across, one for the top edge and the bottom edge. This way I know it's completely covered. And I'm masking off all the balsa wood pieces that I want to be stained. And I'm going to stain it onto the actual piece. So. But this is how I do it. I have a cutting mat and I just measured it out. And I drew the lines as best as I could. I used a previous line to guide the next line. And uh, there you go. I use a very hard um, pencil. So this way I can draw the straight lines as straight as I possibly could. Uh, hardest part here in drawing straight lines is that that ruler is going to want to try to move on you. And make things a little challenging. So spreading it out as much as possible, spreading my hand out as much as possible, trying to keep it straight, is definitely a challenge right here. Also, it's not the length of the actual cutting mat, so I had to continue drawing the line from where I previous left it. So measuring is super important when it comes to this. Now, I could have used some... Um, I do have a product where I can actually put like racing stripes on cars and stuff like that. But I didn't want to use that up, so painter tape came fine. So all I did was hand cut these onto the cutting mat. And once I got that uh, as straight as I possibly can, I create strips. Now the strips, what I use is to be able to mask up the areas uh, and get ready for black bombing, a.k.a. Uh, spray painting their styrofoam. So there it is, all taped up with the painter's tape and strips. Uh, some of the strips went straight around. Some of them uh, took a couple of times. Not too worried about the areas I didn't miss. But I got the majority of it. Um, a good 98% of it is completely covered. All right, there you go. And I sprayed and painted it using Rust-Oleum's um, camouflage paint. It's ultra matte finish. I really do like that. Um, as you can see, I waited two minutes before I started pulling this off. Now this is a trick you do uh, in automotive industry where you don't let it dry completely uh, to take off the masking because if you do, the paint kind of seeps in or allows it to seep in because uh, the water tension issue that we've had when it comes to using uh, flow aid or anything like that is that generally a liquid with pigmentation wants to pool on the edges of the pigmentation uh, when it's spread thinly. And since you sprayed it on here, it's pretty much spread thinly. And you have the tape, it's, the paint's going to start drawing to the tape. The tape's going to start soaking up some of the paint. And once it does that, it actually stains what's ever underneath it. So that paint can actually creep in where you masked and actually you see the lines there where you cut it and it's not even lines. But if you wait about two minutes after you finish spraying it to take off the the, paint, the the tape, the tape will not absorb the paint and you'll have these straight lines when you're done. So this is a great advice, especially if you want to put racing stripes on something or putting some uh, design on something and not just houses or anything like that. So let's say if you have a motorcycle gas tank or something like that and you want to do that, uh, this will work. This uh, method will work as well. If you really wanted to get technical about it, you can put a, a spray coat of gloss or something like that, uh, or a clear, so this way, you know, it'll actually block off any area where the paint can get into. But this is a much quicker method, and it works for me, so, I mean, hopefully it'll work for you. So, just taking all the, uh, all the strips of tape off, and you can see how, how, look at those lines. I mean, they really came out nice, you know, and if there's any over, um, 
black areas, that's not actually the matte paint. That was actually the uh, Mod Podge mix where I overbrushed it. <laughs> so, but the lines itself, when it came to when I sprayed this uh, flat black, I mean, they came out spot on. I can I cannot complain on how they came out. And um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Look how quickly they come off. All the time it took me to actually put them on. <laughs> came off pretty quickly. Which I don't want them to give me a hard time anyway. So, And I'm using an X-Acto blade just to lift up the uh, little pieces of paint. Be careful not to gouge your uh, whatever you're working on. And you see the chipboard on the bottom kind of holds it together. That's what I like and you know, I ripped those, I ripped the bottom piece off and you can leave it on if you want to, but I've tried putting like uh scenery on the base and everything like that. And the chipboard for as much as it's resilient, uh, it does absorb water. So if you're using water as like washes and stuff like that, it'll curl up on you. And I don't like that. So there, I guess if I had a, a styrofoam base, uh, then it won't but then that might chip really easy and it's not as sturdy. So it's super easy to get off, uh, easy way to cut lines um, when painting and rattle cans work just fine on styrofoam as long as you uh, coat the styrofoam. Uh, I use the Mod Podge again and with the black to indicate where I got it because any area you don't cover with Mod Podge will start melting on you. And the results, unless you really wanted the dilapidated kind of building, it doesn't look that great. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stain all the uh, the woodwork here. Uh, it was really hard to get the tripod in there, so I kind of just did it by hand, so I pardoned the shaky camera. But I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do my best to be able to uh, show you what I did there. Uh huh. So there's the thatching of the roof, and all those thatching that I did before, that's as much of the roof as it covered on both sides. The other side is done, but that's where it ended, so I had to make more. And I'm going to show you how I added the thatching to the roof. I actually created more uh, using that incredibly dangerous method. And I'm just going to put a row on here and tell you what to do. Uh, you want to make sure the top ends of the thatching are even. That's the part you have to worry about. And as long as it covers a bit of the bottom thatching, you're good. And you want to kind of, I, I want to kind of go up as far as I possibly can with the thatching only because, you know, the, the further you go up, the less thatching you actually need uh, for it to look right, right? So, but some people want to make more thatching. If that's your thing, you do it. When I hot glue it, I hot glue it to the top piece of the thatching where it's actually connecting to the styrofoam and not the bottom piece as well. I do notice that if I try to do the top and the bottom that some of the hot glue is going to kind of seep out. And if it seeps out like that, um, then it's gonna look like a whole bunch of hot glue on your thatched roof. And I kind of didn't want to go for that look. So I just did it on one area. Um, the thatching can fall off and you can just like gorge a hole into your uh, into your uh, roof, but you may want to just leave the thatching off that at that point, paint the little piece that, that came off flat black inside and um, it looks like you have some damage. That, that might be a thing. Or you could just re-glue it. Not a big deal uh, to re-glue any of these thatched roofs. Uh, some of them pieces, I actually went a little bit diagonal on them to make sure that the roof isn't straight because I know I'm not going to get these straight anyway. Uh, right before you get to the end of the line itself, I kind of, uh, learned that if you do the ends before you do, like get close enough, you see where the top line is and you do the end piece right there. Uh, of the line, you'd be able to uh, deviate one of the middle pieces. So this way it's not, if it's not straight perfectly across, uh, you can actually afford to maybe make a crooked thatching to make up some room or, you know, um, so this way all the thatching could fit within the room. And that goes for anything that you have to line up. You start from the beginning and you work yourself close to the end and then put the, the end piece on and then work towards the middle. That's how I do. Okay. Uh, unless there were like I was tiling something and everything has to be absolutely perfectly even, then I go from one end and just go straight across. Uh, but for the thatching, for this roof, best thing to do is put that end piece there and kind of like, you know, use the bottom pieces to kind of guide where your next piece is going to go. Use the top line to be straight across so this way it's nice and even. Bottom line may be different lengths and that looks fine. 
Uh, it actually gives a character for the bottom uh, thatching part is not even, but the top needs to be even because when you put the next row, it's going to have to cover evenly towards the top. I mean, that's going to be your next thatching roof. Not it's going to look like, um, I don't know, it's falling apart or something like that. So um, I wanted to record actually doing a straight line all the way. So this way uh, you can see what that's like. A little bit of glue on top. Putting it here. I burnt my hands several times doing this because I, I'm clumsy. Um, you know, not perfect. I'm definitely clumsy. And I uh, burnt my hand many, many times. Now I don't think in this example, the poor example, uh, I, I put the end piece in. Oh, there it is. There it is. I put the end piece right there. Okay. So yeah, I got close to the end. Then I put the end piece. And I'm going to work my way up to the line. So this way I know how many pieces fit in between. And two pieces should fit in between right here. But it didn't. I could put one like, you know, angled, and that'll be fine. Because it has the black on the bottom, it gives it that shadow. All right. And if it's too short, you know, put one crooked. <laughs> that'll work too. Um, you know, crooked, it means like one is laying on top of another one just partially. And that'll work too. So you see, start from one and get close to the end and put it to the other side. And work your way back. There you go. That's how I do a row of thatch roofing. And I just repeat that process over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I take off the webbing, uh, the wisps that the, uh, I like the word wisps, <laughs> little wisps that the hot glue creates. And once you get all that out, it looks, I, I think it looks really good. And that's the theme to my, um, my whole village. They're all going to have that kind of thatched roof. So I'm committed to that. So no matter what the design or how it looks like or what the color of the house is and everybody can have their old uh, house, I guess they had the same roofer. And there it is, it is all done. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some Steinol Res and that's primer and I'm using a really soft brush. These are uh, Nicole brushes. I think I got them from AC Moore. If not, they were from Hobby Lobby. And I just dry brush. There you go. And I do it in a lot of different layers. Like I, I just made it nice and soft transition. If you put too much paint on there at one time, um, it's just going to like smear all over the place and get all chalky and nasty. Uh, this will still get a little chalky, but it's not as bad, especially if you put super light coats on it. You see, it's not really covering just about anything. And dry brushing, if you didn't know, is taking paint without diluting it uh, and putting a little bit on your brush and then wiping your brush off on something that can soak up some of the paint. So all you're left with is a pretty much dry brush, but there's still paint on there just a little bit, just a little, little bit. And when you pass it over an item, it's only going to paint the raised edges and leave all the, the crevices alone. So this way in the crevice, you'll have a shadow and on the top edges of whatever you're painting is going to be a lighter color. And what that does is add definition to your model. And this one, uh, since that it's, it's a very shallow uh, texture, I had to be somewhat aggressive in layers. In fact, I had to uh, dry brush it several times before I got the consistency where I want, and it still came out pretty dark. There you go. Uh, I don't know if you can see it all that well on this. Probably not because the lights are pretty bright, but eh, there's some uh, there's some highlights there. <laughs> Trust me on this one. Um, and I must have dry brushed it before I uh, finished that roof there. That side of the roof anyway. I finished the other side of the roof, which came out. Next, I want to pick out some blocks. And I'm picking it out with that original color. Um, for the last build, I airbrushed the blocks in. This I wanted to do it a little different. I want to hand paint it uh, just because I just wanted to. I felt like it. So you can hand paint it. I'm using a sable brush. It doesn't really have a tip to it. It's a brush that I really don't care too much about. Uh, I just didn't have a tip and I got the wrong brush, but so I just, you know, I'm going to use it for something. That's for sure. Um, but synthetic brushes work just fine here as well. And what you're going to do is you want to kind of alternate and spread out the picked out blocks, the contrast blocks, I call them. Uh, so this way you can have some kind of variety to it and just kind of mix it up. And, uh, and I like the last build, I did three different colors on this one. I think I did four different colors on the last one, but I did three different colors on this one. And I came, kept it in the family of the colors that I used for the last cottage. So even though the brickwork here is a lot darker than the brickwork for the last one, uh, 
it still has the same types of colors in it, unifying it in some degree, which is exactly what I want to. All right, so when I'm painting out these bricks. What I do is I trace out the outline in there, and then I'll just go straight in the middle. So it's sort of like just edging, what you do when you do paint jobs, when you're painting walls or something like that. You kind of want to cover the edges first and then just do the center. Um, and if you can't cut edges, then you may want to consider some uh, painter's tape in order to do so. But after a while, your free hand will become pretty well. And what I do is when I paint these, I lean my hand on a table or I cut my hand with one hand just to steady it, then lean both of them on a table and limit my movement to the strokes that I need to uh, put on to the actual item. Yep, now I'm going to do the back as well, which is a lot of fun. Um, and this portion of, of creating this, see, I wanted to show you what I did with my hand and see if I do the larger pieces. Like I'm actually locking my wrist into place with one hand while limiting my hand to certain movements in the middle. And that's how I steady my hand, you know, especially if I have to go up, usually. I just lock it into place like that and lock my arms into place and hold my wrist and then just use it. All right, so these are the colors I use. You can use any colors you want. This is a Minotaur uh, brand. Kind of want to work my way through that um, paint and then only and then and only then will I um, go for some war colors. Uh, maybe I'll go some fantasy and games, but I have a lot of paint and I kind of want to go through the paints that you know, um, I don't know. Some paints work really well in the Minotaur line for me. Some, not so much. They get uh, really, really glossy. And I guess I could just throw some matte medium in there just to tone it down. But you have to work with some of the Minotaur stuff. Um, although, you know, the colors are pretty good. Uh, hand painting them, I guess they're meant for the airbrush, not really for the hand painting stuff. Uh, not like... Uh, Model Air from Vallejo, which you can just use really well with a paintbrush. This one, eh, eh, it's all right. Some of the colors give me a problem. Some of them, not so much. I still use them, you know, because there's, I am going to get my pennies worth out of everything I buy, period. You know, I'm going to get my money's worth. I'm frugal like that. All right, so you can see that I didn't get just the cobblestone, that I actually have designs going through uh, the building where I picked the dry brush. And I went a little too heavy and excessive on some of the dry brushing right there. But that's okay. I'm not going to beat myself up about it. You know, just got to go in very, very light passes and be very, very careful that you have a, just a little hint of um, paint on the dry brush in order to do it. And I'm learning. See, you make mistakes. But you know what? When I put the banding on it, the banding itself is going to distract from those, and you won't really see it. I mean, you'll know, but you know what? That only means that you're learning, and the next one, next time you're going to do better. The end. And you can look back on this one day and say, yeah, I remember those days. I thought this was pretty neat, but now look at what I'm doing. And you can actually judge it on what you did before, which is awesome to me. That's what makes a world of difference when it comes to creating stuff. It's like you always look back on your old models and you can actually see a history of how you improved, you know. And uh, whenever I get discouraged, because sometimes I look at this uh, website called Paint and Putty, and sometimes I look at the artist and I say, well, I'm not going to be as good as that because I'm not them. I'm me. And uh, sometimes, I mean, I've been told already that people say, well, I can't paint like, like you paint. I'm like... I don't even think I'm that good. I mean, I'm all right, I guess. I mean, I think it looks kind of cool and I'm happy with it, but I, I am not winning any golden demons anytime soon, you know? <laughs> and the whole nature of competition is you're judging yourself. Well, people are judging your work with other people. So it kind of goes against uh, the whole measuring yourself with your own, you know, how well you did yesterday, you know? Ultimately, you're not out in this world to impress other people. You're out to impress yourself. And if you do that, then you'll have a good time. If not, it invites misery. A lot of misery. <laughs> all right, here it is, all painted. And I put a yellow ochre in there too, just to throw it up. And I put that watch piece. And this is a jewelry piece that I got, a uh, steam and punk kind of design. I just kind of threw it in there. I was going to do some stained glass, but there it is. Uh, there's the banding uh, on the bottom. This is not completed, but 
what is completed is the various paint and the paint hasn't dried. So uh, the actual yellow is going to get subdued. So next we're going to do the door. What I do is I take coffee stirs. This, I picked up some coffee stirs where I get my coffee. I asked if I can have some. They said, Psh, dude, you can take as many as you like. I was like, thank you very much. Handful in my pocket. But you can actually buy these as well. Uh, they sell them. Uh, I think I got these at Walmart or something. They sell them there. Um, just popsicle sticks, small ones, coffee stir kind of popsicle sticks. I think these are the smallest ones that I've seen as far as popsicle sticks are concerned. Um, they are definitely the thinnest ones that I've seen. Uh, they also sell dowels of different sizes, and I like that brand that I use. I guess I got it from Walmart. I'm not sure. But there you go. All I did was cut the ends off, and I use these snippers to do so. Boop. Makes it real easy to just chop that off. And I used four of them to create about one inch. Again, these don't have to be straight. I do want to make it two inches long so they could sway they could be a door itself. I may have to move the camera just a bit to get through. Um, working with a, a tripod in your uh, seating area is kind of tricky sometimes, so sometimes I bang into it. All right, getting my pencil really quickly and just marking off the two inch mark uh, for the door because that's the height. You kind of want to get this a little bit right because uh, you don't want it to overhang. And another blessing for having the chipboard on the bottom is you know where the floor meets your uh, building. And in doing so, you know that uh, how far you need to go with this uh, without it you know, messing up your gaming table or anything like that. It's nice and even. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put, since I have a see-through uh, ruler here, I'm just gonna push the ends in, try to make it flat as possible, hold it together and just one line straight across. Bingo, door is done. I love shortcuts, I do. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut each individual piece with a jeweler's uh, saw here. Kind of want to hold it close uh, and not let it wiggle too, too much. And I could have used a cutting board, but I'm, I'm doing it so gently that it's not even cutting through paper on the bottom. That's, that's pretty gently there. Um, yeah, the only injuries that I've gotten on this project, which is miraculous, is the burning of my finger due to uh, the hot glue gun. When I was putting the thatch on the roof, I kind of dropped it and it kind of like landed on my... Um, my middle finger and it just, I try to lift it off really quickly and lift the skin off with it. <laughs> Pretty gross, right? But hey, you know what? Accidents happen sometimes. Blood, sweat, and tears in this thing. If you've ever uh, cut some really tough resin and, you know, gotten a razor blade in your finger, then you know what I'm talking about. Accidents happen sometimes. Especially me being clumsy, again, using that uh, Dremel tool, I don't know what possessed me, but I'll tell you one thing. I did get through them quicker. Not that I recommend it for you guys. I don't. I do not recommend it at all. I'm just showing you how I did my build. Again, you can approach this any way you want to approach this, you know. I just did what I felt like I wanted to do, and that's pretty much it. I'm not promoting this is the way, and I'm not calling this an actual tutorial where you have to follow my stuff step by step in order to make it. I'm just kind of showing you what I did and you know, while I built this in hobby. That's why it's a build and chat, because it's actually more a build and ramble, because that's what I do. I just kind of talk about whatever is the flavor. Uh, speaking of which, if you want me to brush upon a topic or two about hobbying and stuff like that, leave a comment below, and my next video while I'm rambling on, I'll deal with those topics as well. All right. So here I'm used to using the banding for the doors, and that is just another piece that I bought uh, from the same brand as the popsicle sticks, and it's just little pokey sticks. And I use these pokey sticks to mix my airbrush stuff and everything else, and I use it for banding, so I use them for a lot of different purposes. And there they are, just putting it across, I guess, a little from, from the top, and then I do a little bit on the bottom. I didn't really measure it out. I just did what felt right. I just make sure when I chopped it up that I sanded the edges so this way it'll fit in the doorway uh, easily when I put it in there. Sometimes I dry fit. I don't know if I dry fit this one um, before I put it in there. I'm pretty sure I did. I always try to dry fit anything before I put it in there uh, because once the glue is on it, you just have to commit to whatever you know mistake or non-mistake that you just did. And I'm just using a metal file. Yeah, I just put a little, took a little bit of piece of wood in there, add character to it. There you go, I dry fitted it. Nope, gotta go down a little more. And that's why, that's why you dry fit.
because you're kind of just adjusting, you know, you're not too stressed out about it. Just kind of do what you got to do. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, file it down. I dry fit it again, and then I'm just going to glue it on. And then I stain it up. I think that's the next step. I stain up all the banding and stuff like that uh, for the door and for the banding on the side. And then I decided to add more banding later on in the build, which is coming up. I think in the next 15 minutes or so. I don't know. All right, well, there you go. Uh, it's starting to come together there. You can see the process. All right, getting to do a different angle there. And all I'm doing is just taking those Nicole brushes that I have. I think that's an eight. And just getting into the recesses and just dumping it in, really. I'm not trying to do light coats. I'm trying to do a dark coat. Just because I feel like it. No particular reason. You can do a light coat if you want to. But there you go. Nothing uh, professionally done, really easily done uh, going through. Just be really careful with it. Uh, again, if you stain the uh, acrylics, it's going to stain it. It's going to get dark and obsidian and glossy, and you don't want to kind of do that. I don't like shiny and glossy for my uh, paint jobs. I kind of like a matte finish because that's just me. I don't want reflective surfaces on there. If I want a reflective sur surface or have the illusion of a reflective surface, I want to be the one to add that on there, to add the dimension and depth, because that just makes it look really cool in my opinion. Um, but, you know, when it comes to staining the wood, I kind of want to stain it. That actually has a little bit of satin shine to it, but uh, it doesn't bother me, surprisingly enough. Okay, so now that door is done there. I'm going to put on these like little lights because I want to kind of embellish this somewhat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit it underneath the banding for the bottom. Um, so I'm going to do all four sides just to add that little bit of texture. And that's just a jewelry piece that I picked up. Uh, I think it was Walmart in the bead section. Uh, guys, if you're a guy, don't be afraid to go into the bead section. There's a lot of cool things that you can add to your terrain pieces, possibly your miniature bases or something like that. You never know what you might find. You know, especially the extensive. But you kind of want to get this in the middle. Uh, so feel it out. I did it in the middle of the door. That was kind of easy for me. And then put it upside, uh, right side up and make sure it's leveled to the ground so it looks kind of cool. And there you go. Got, got yourself like a makeshift light or lamp that's going to happen within the building or bell or whatever that's going to be. It just like kind of look cool. Um, and uh, those L brackets, I uh, put some stain on it to make it look obsidian. And be very careful on the edges with that. You kind of don't want to go a little overboard with that. So just take your time and do those if you're going to do that uh, obsidian. Although, if I have carved these out, I would have painted them red, just like I did my tower. Um, I didn't actually do a video on the tower itself, which was my first uh, large building terrain piece, which I was just playing around with and just getting used to. Uh, it doesn't have a lot to it, <laughs> but it does have uh, a bit to it that I learned how to dry brush and everything else. Uh, I did carve those bricks out by hand, so I was a little more aggressive with the dry brush. Alrighty, so there you go. I think the next building I build, I might want to, I don't know, create my own wash and then just like paint it gray and then wash over it just to get the recesses, then dry brush after I'm done. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't figured it out. But if I'm actually going to do it, uh, do this method on the pink foam, maybe it'll actually give me deeper recesses uh, when I do the rolling pin on it. So let's see what kind of options I get with that. All right, here's the back piece there, kind of moving around there. I guess I could have secured that a little bit better. Just getting an idea of what it's supposed to look like. Dry fitting it. Again, dry fit. Then that's not really staying on too well. So I think I drop it or something. I don't know. I'm going to put this in the middle. Try to put as much as possible and try not to get it all over the place. At least try, right? And then uh, just fitting that on there just like that. Hopefully it came out all right. And that's just it. You know, you got to play around with it a little bit. Uh, take the wisp off, make sure it's dried. And stand it up to make sure it looks cool. Yeah, I was not happy with this. So I kind of pulled it off. 
there you go. And that's just it. You know, you can just, it's trial and error kind of thing. Um, kind of want to make sure it looks cool when it stands up because that's the majority of this life going to be. I could have done a rear door, possibly. Am I going to do it? Nope. Maybe in the next build. <laughs> Maybe in the next house. And that's just it. I'm not going to kill myself over it. So I'm just trying to take the excess glue off, maybe just heat up a little bit of the glue that's in there, put a little bit more in there, and try to get it straight the way I want it to be. All right, let's try this a second time. And that's okay. I mean, sometimes you got to do it more than one time in order to get it the way you want it. But I think the embellishment, like if, <laughs> if you're ever in the craft aisle, uh, you will uh, – I've gotten looks. I've gotten looks. Uh, when I was in the bead section, they kind of give me a look. So you just have to be able to not to let that bother you. If you can not let that bother you, you can find a lot of cool little trinkets and stuff like that into your bead aisle. And I put them in these little pill um, baggies that I find. And you can get them at uh, any kind of medical supply place or any kind of like fair and garage sales or yard sales and stuff like that. Well, they have like, you know, dentist tools and stuff like that. Usually the pill bottle uh, baggies are there. I think I picked that up for three bucks at this place called the Green Dragon. Uh, all right, this one, the uh, glue went a little bit out of control, but it's kind of got it into control by uh, shoving some of the actual item onto it just a little bit, <laughs> the, the actual embellishment onto it. Um, so clean it off. I just want to pick some of that glue off. Kind of got a little overzealous with that. See, accidents do happen. But there you go. I mean, I don't think it looks absolutely terrible. I think it looks all right. All righty. So, you know, all, after it's said and done, having little embellishments, I think that added a lot of character to this. And I kind of wanted to use those uh, lights for something. I didn't know what. And since it was like a clockwork thing, I think it looks pretty cool. There it is. Yeah, and I took it off the bottom base there. Uh, so now again, it's really top heavy. <laughs> so I'm holding it by uh, the styrofoam and hopefully it's fine. And it seemed to be fine. So, you know, I'm not done with this yet. I did take a picture of this point and did my work in progress picture and put it up on Facebook. But now it's time to create the banding around that really adds some character to this piece. And this is the final piece that I'm going to do uh, for this before I call it done. And what I'm doing here is I kind of want to uh, cut out the banding and the size of the banding so it can go around the entire building. And then what I'm going to do is put little crossbars. Now I was thinking about doing X's, but mm, it's a whole lot of work. And if I do like V or zigzag pattern, it'll look just as good in my opinion. Plus it's half the amount of time. And this is a palette cleanser. Uh, so, hey, you know what? I went the easy route. That's it. I'm going to make this fun, enjoyable, and easy. So that's the way I went. If you want to put cross hatches in there, you can. Uh, and in order to make a box, uh, all you have to do is cut one end and then cut two smaller ends on, on the either side. Uh, to make an X, all right? you just have to delete the size or the width of the actual banding in between it. And so one is complete and the other two are smaller minus the section or the width of the actual banding uh, in order to create that X. But again, I went zigzag. I didn't want to go through all that uh, cutting. I cut enough when it comes to the roof and I was just happy with that. So now it's just about deciding the height of the band and you kind of want to go all the way around as well. Uh, so just make sure that you go all the way around. And this, this part here is exciting because you see, it was kind of dull for me and there was just too much area where there was just nothing. So what I did was I, I took out the miter box. Yes, I did not use a Dremel tool on this side. And I took a little hacksaw and not, I have always had a hard time with these things. And it was really frustrating for a long period of time because the wood just gets stuck like that. And I realized that if you're super gentle, that that doesn't happen. And that I'm just being too rough with it. Just being too rough with it. And that's the problem. Okay. And I remedied that problem. So it's not a problem anymore. Now I know. Hopefully I can remember. And what you're doing is going for the 45 degree cuts on both sides. Um, 
Yeah, 45 degrees cuts on both sides. You want to make them equal on the top and the bottom. So this way you can uh, put a 45 degree angle cut in there, uh, angled side in there when you put that, uh, when you actually put it onto um, the banding or. And the 45 degree cuts, uh, two 45 degree cuts will give a 90 degree angle. If you do your math, 45 plus 45 is 90. 90 is a straight line. That's what you kind of want to do, or a straight L line. Uh, 180 is a straight line, so having that 90 degree angles on both sides, 90 and 90, 180, and you'll have a straight line. And I am not a mathematical genius, so I, I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> if you are a mathematical genius, you, I probably need corrections with that. But I do know, since I'm not like a math scientist or anything like that, I do know that I should just, you know, uh, I laid this on my lap here and I kind of like laid it out before I put it and glued it in place. And um, it was a bit of a struggle for me to figure out how to do it. Uh, so this way it's even. And I didn't measure all the ones together, but I did do is I put like a upside down V or an A uh, on one side. And then I went to the other side and did another one. And then I figured out the middle. I think that's where the I did uh, the best. I don't know if the first one was like that. You kind of want to get the height right. So there you go. I put the first A there and uh, the first one and try to get the height into it and commit right there. This is the big moment. This is what's going to determine the height of it all the way around the whole entire building. So there. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And laying on a lap like this, you know, uh, it's a bit different. <laughs> a little bit different uh, styling of it, but uh, a style of videotaping. And you could see that, you know, I have a very big uh, basement. Huge, in fact. Like ginormous. I could throw a ball to the end of the way. I could play catch in here. No problem. And, um, my nephews actually race their big wheel around here, and they actually have a, a course in which they, they race their big wheel. So, yeah, I limit my hobby space to one area of this ginormous uh, man cave slash basement, which I could probably put a pool table in here and a gaming table on the other side. It's massive. I'm lucky. I'm super lucky. Um, but I have about, oh, my goodness. Uh, I didn't finish the, the the roofs of this, so the lighting is kind of poor, even though I have 1,800 uh, equivalent lo uh, watts of light um, pumped through here and another 1,800 with the uh, lamps to record here. So essentially, I have over 3,000 watts of light coming in, and it still looks pretty dark. <laughs> oh, my gracious me. All right, so I, I start on the ends with this banding here getting off the top topic of lights and basements. Uh, and then I did the middle. And I figured that's the best way to do it because then I could just adjust stuff as I need to right in the middle. Uh, as long as the ends look complete, that's all you really, really, really need. Uh, so there it is. And it came out pretty well, in my opinion. I kind of like the V-step. Again, so you could put the X's in there, but uh, you'd have to do cross members and you'd have to cut the middle size out. So this way you have a top piece and a bottom piece to make that X for each X, you know. But didn't feel like doing it, so I just zigzag. Looks good to me. And you'll see the, the finished product. There's me being lazy <laughs> or having fun. I don't know if it's being lazy. Because if it looks good in the end, then, you know, who cares? There it is. Ta-da. Ta-da-ta-da. ta 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 Then I'll do the front. The front I did a little bit different than I did the sides. Uh, again, I'm doing both sides. Again, once you got the first one started, uh, I did both sides, uh, front, uh, left, and right. And then you want to go for the middle, and you kind of want them to mate as close as possible. There you go. And kind of want to make it even as well. Oops. <laughs> Moved it up. And definitely this adds character to it. It needed something. It had all those blank walls and I had to do something with it. So there you go. I didn't really put windows on this one because it's clockwork. <laughs> That's the beauty of this one. It's clockwork. So I kind of wanted to make it like a machine. Like 
like I already see like a D and D story where I have a lot, a lot of clockwork items, or maybe a gnome lives in here or something, or somebody likes to fiddle around with mechanical stuffs and have a lot of automated stuff come to life. I think that would be cool, or maybe that could be like you know uh, a portal to mechanicus level or mechanicus. Uh, plane or machine plane or something like that. I know there's something like that in D and D. No, uh, it could be a portal to that, and it's just, just like some innocent building. And as, as you go in, you discover some nefarious plot to try to bring uh, more order into life because you know, somebody got slighted, and um, he wants to bring more order into life. Uh, and there you go. I would think maybe uh, a husband and wife, the wife passed away because of some, you know, disorder that had happened and that he wants to make things life right in the world. So he's got to be like all obsessed with it. And he actually made the inside of his house to be all mechanical and stuff because, you know, when it comes to numbers and law, it is, you know, there's no... There's no crime in math, you know, unless you're like using math for evil purposes. But math itself, like adding and subtracting, you can't, there's no evil to adding and subtracting. It's either adding or subtracting. It's logical. So here I am rambling about a story that I haven't even created for a scenario for people I haven't even met in a D&D campaign. Yeah, that's how I did. So I decided, <laughs> let's get back to the topic because I really went off the deep end there. I decided to uh, start moving things in the middle here. Uh, just moving the banding around and playing around with uh, what I should do. Should I put a straight up uh, um, banding there or should I get an X? That does not look right in my opinion. So what I decided doing is taking these two bandings and moving them in the middle like that and just separating them and that looks a lot better. Look at that. That looks pretty cool right there. So that's exactly what I was going to do. Um, so since I couldn't get three in there, I kind of did it like that. And that's how I play around with ideas. I kind of just like shift it around and see what I like and then just go for it. Simple, right? Um, I try not to overthink things. I notice that when I overthink things, they come out really messed up. So I just go for it. And that's just the way it is. All right. So we're coming up to the last 10 minutes of this build. Uh, I think the last thing I do is just stain these up, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, I am really happy to um, to where the quality of this came out and how quickly I got her done. Really happy with that. But yeah, yeah, I could take this banding and I could just put it straight in all around. And there it is. Yep. So I think with all the embellishments and everything like that came out really nice. And uh, with a house this big, I'll call it a bigature instead of a miniature. You know, the house this big, you got to lay it on your lap. It doesn't work on like one table. I actually, it took me, it takes me two tables in order to construct these houses. And this one being two stories, the biggest one I've built so far. If I do ever actually do that uh, church in my hometown, then um, I mean it's 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 really big. <laughs> it's there's no other way to say it. it is a, it'll be a presence. I don't even know if I can use it for a war game uh, war gaming table because it, it might be just like I mean I might maybe on one end of the field and it'll be like a siege kind of thing. Oh hey there you go. Just talking through, I just thought I had some inspiration for that. So yeah. Um, I'm excited about working on this village. Uh, there's a lot of things that I want to put in there. I did get some terrain pieces from the Bones miniature series. Um, and Bones, if you don't know, it was a Kickstarter from Reaper Miniatures. Reaper Miniatures are the only miniatures that I started painting when I started getting into miniatures. And to me, I mean, they have some amazing sculpts and some sculpts that are okay. Um, but they started out with this Bones Kickstarter when they actually made a special kind of recycled PVA kind of plastic. Um, or some kind of recycled plastic. And it's like, you know, bendy swords are pretty tough. I don't like them. I like a harder plastic for those. But um, for the money you spend to get the miniatures that you get, 
I mean, the value is astronomical, especially when you compare things like uh, GW pricing models. Now, granted, the GW models are amazing, and like when it comes to building them and putting them together, they, they, they're intuitive. They are a painter's model, and what I mean by that is that they have extremely raised areas, and they're heroic kind of scale, so this way, you know, the hands are not too small or anything like that, and they're just easier to paint. Uh, when you get to weird miniatures are more accurate, uh, and when I say that, it's like Malifaux and stuff like that, um, they really have like, I mean, cool looking models, but they're not very intuitive as far as building them. They look cool, but you definitely have to be quite experienced modeler to put those together. They're not like easy plop into place. Like GW just came in with SnapFit, which is like snap type models. <laughs> you just like put them into there and you don't even need glue. Wow, <laughs> you know, really? Um, so that really makes it easy. So building these models with a barrier, a top barrier to entry, that helps it. But the pricing, uh, they're kind of expensive. Like, I'm not going to lie. They are very expensive. But uh, the quality is there. All right, so the banding is on. I think it looks really good now. It really needed that banding. It really needed something. Um, it was definitely lacking. And I do like that, I, you know, I, I painted the stonework and it shows through the banding. That that's, gives it dimension and depth. Okay. So yeah, Reaper Miniatures, if you don't know, it was a Kickstarter. I just got onto the four. I guess you can go on Amazon, look for uh, Bones Kickstarters and try to get what you can. I think you can get three so far. Uh, it's a little more expensive than the Kickstarter itself if you start it. But if you actually go into the Kickstarter, uh, that'll help you. And if you go to reaperminiatures.com, reapermini.com, uh, you can actually check out when the next uh, Kickstarter is going to be. I would think it's going to be in the next two years. And you, with the Kickstarter like this large, you actually buy the miniatures or invest in some miniatures and you'll get them like two years from now when they actually make the molds and actually create them and mass produce them. Uh, and if you jump on it, you can actually be the first tier or second tier. I was in the second tier of the Bones 4 Kickstarter, and which that means I'll get it in February, which is my birthday month, uh, 2018, 19, 2019. So two years from now, I'm going to get myself a birthday present <laughs> with a whole bunch of miniatures. And since I got the, uh, they sent me the, Kickstarter 3, I'll have from here until then to actually paint up all those miniatures so this way I'm not overwhelmed. Plus, I have a ton of miniatures. If you see my intros uh, and on one, my other videos, you can see that I have a ton of miniatures and a ton of projects, which I'm really excited about starting uh, in the background. So, do I really need to make terrain features? No, not really. I have enough to keep me busy, but it would make my table look a lot cooler. Plus, I got two table war mats um, for my table that once I put that down and have all these terrain features, man, it's going to look really cool, you know. Um, maybe I'll record a game or two and put it on the, the, the channel. I don't know. Or something. I'll show you some setups that I have uh, and see if you like it. You know, sharing that stuff with you. Again, this uh, YouTube is a hobby about my hobby. And uh, this is a hobby in itself, actually recording and stuff like that. Uh, I might get into Twitch. I don't know. A lot of people are getting into Twitch. I don't know. I'm still trying to learn YouTube, so we'll see. We'll see. Do some live streaming and stuff like that. That would be kind of cool. And there's no editing, so it's a lot quicker. But I do like editing because I'm learning how to edit. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Uh, using a Nicole brush in here. Uh, right in... In retrospect, I could have used a smaller brush. Yeah. And I do recommend you use a smaller brush. I had to use a, my controlled hand technique in order to actually brush these on. Uh, and even with that, I kind of want to overbrush here and there. Um, but all in all, I mean, it came out pretty cool. And I have pictures of my finished model. Uh, this is the final step that I use. Again, you can put more embellishments on there if you want to. Uh, your build can be any way you want to build it. That's up to you. Uh, me, I stop here. I'm sure you could do a lot better than I did. I'm just giving you the basics and showing you that it's really not that hard if you invest some time into it. And if you go to make something, uh, just go for it. You know, don't be intimidated by it and just, you know, use some of the principles that I use and expand upon the principles. I mean, that's what I do when I look at YouTube. I look at somebody do something and I try to expand it and make it my own and, you know, just try to take it to my level and where I'm happy with or make it easier for me and not go to the full extent. But um, I think it looked pretty good. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm really rock and rolling with a lot of different projects and stuff like that. I'm going to have to get back to my Space Wolves at some point. I do want to finish that box before I move on. I do have Engineers Jeff. I won it in a competition. He has Scorn. Uh, but my gaming group is kind of like really wanting me to finish some Troll Bloods as well. So this way I can start playing um, some Warmer Hordes with them. Uh, and, and increasing my forces. Because I just have the same miniatures that I keep playing with and playing with and playing with. All right. Well, this one's pretty much done. I'll finish it. Later. That's all there is to it. Here I have my terrain piece next to my Lonely Hearts Cottage that I built. So you can see it's significantly taller and bigger with a lot more features going on. I'm learning as a terrain builder, so as I progress, it's going to continuously improve. However, uh, it's still going to have a theme within the house is uh, throughout the entire village. So this way when I set them up on the game board, it kind of has a cohesiveness to it. Well, I hope you liked this video. I hope you found it helpful. And I'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush. Yeah.